Okay. I'm going to say good morning and welcome. Welcome to Brownville Community Church. We're still um, waiting for a few people to show up, but as they show up, I will admit them. Um, I think we're just missing Walter and Judy right now. Um, but um, as I always say, I've gotten permission for, you, for me to record you so others can watch this later. And the music that we will um, listen to and sing along to comes from our hymnals that we own and we will be singing them at home and not um, be singing for any monetary purpose or to monetize this worship service. Um, before we begin, I would like to ask if there are any announcements from the congregation. I do have a couple. Any of you? Joan Chapman uh, asked me to remind everybody that there is a social committee meeting this Wednesday at 6.30. Wonderful, thank you. And I will be attending by Zoom. Um, and so if there are others who want to attend that way, you can. Um, but I know that often you all attend uh, in person with your masks on, so that is fine. Um, I do remind everyone that next week is the first Sunday of the month and we will be having communion. So I will just say now and I will remind again at the end of the week um, for you to prepare a bit of juice uh, or wine or whatever, fruit of the vine and bread um, and prepare those and we will uh, share communion together. Are there any other announcements before we begin? If not, I'm going to um, ask you to mute yourselves, except for Larry and Jenny, who are going to be leading us in the call to worship. So let us be in the spirit of worship. And I will share the screen for everyone. Go right ahead, um, Ginny and Larry. Yes. Walk before me and be blameless, said God to Abram, and I shall make my covenant between me and you. Quite openly, we've measured that distance. Quite openly, we've stayed away. Quite openly, we've distanced ourselves. Quite openly, we didn't want to be closer. Quite openly, we are not blameless. Quite openly, we are here. We are here to open ourselves to God. And Jitty and um, Larry, if you'll just mute, and I will. We will now open with the doxology. Okay. And now, Shannon, if you will please unmute and read our Old Testament reading. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you, and I will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. 
I will bless her. And moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Thank you. And now we will have our song. And Larry and Ginny will, will lead us. And you'll just need to unmute Larry and Ginny. I will tell of your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he did not despise or abhor the affliction of the afflicted. He did not hide his face from me, but heard when I cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will pray, pay before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. And it just continues. Does. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. To him indeed shall all who sleep in the earth bow down. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust. And I shall live for him. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. And proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn saying that he has done it. Good morning, Walter and Judy. Um, no problem. I'm just going to ask you to mute your microphone. Um, if you can find your mute button and then um, it will make sure we don't have feedback. There we go. And so now I invite um, Nancy to read uh, the epistle reading this morning. Not through law, not on the condition that the promises be merited by works of the law, his offspring, all those of whom Abraham is said to be father to. Can you hear me? We can. Is that, is that okay? All right, okay. You're doing great. Heir of the world. World here refers to the creation as in 120. No express mention of the heirship is made in the Genesis account of Abraham. He is promised offering like the dust of the earth and possession of the land of Canaan and that all the peoples on earth will be blessed through him or his offspring. But since, as Genesis has already made clear, God purposed through Abraham and his offspring to work out the destiny of the whole world. It was implicit in the promise to Abraham that he and his offspring would inherit the earth. The full realization of this awaits the consummation of the messianic kingdom of Christ's return. Those who live by law, those who claim to be the inheritance is based on the fulfillment of the law. Faith, for if those who live by the law are heirs, faith has no value and the promise is worthless because law brings wrath. And where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, the promise comes by faith so that it may be by grace. You shall be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. 
He is our father in the sight of God, in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls things that are not as though they were. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old and that Sarah's room, womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteous. The words it, it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us, for whom God will credit righteousness. For us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised into life for our justification. Thank you, Nancy. That is a theologically very packed um, reading you just read. I will now bring up our, our sermon hymn. And now um, I'll just remind everyone to mute your mics if you haven't, haven't, and I will read our gospel reading according to Mark. Let's see if this will work this way. There we go. Our gospel reading comes from Mark chapter eight, verses 27 through 38. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, 
well, who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the son of man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at the disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind on not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed. And when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Here ends the readings. May God bless their hearing and understanding. This morning, the title of my sermon is Getting One's Affairs and Life in Order. When I was in my 40s, a new drug for multiple sclerosis came out. It was a very exciting time for me as it meant the end of painful daily shots being replaced with simple monthly IV medication. Before I was set to begin, I had a consultation with my neurologist. She said, while well, the medication was going to be great for me, there was, however, a 3% chance that while taking this medication, I could develop a kind of leukemia that was absolutely untreatable. And the longer that, the one, that one took the medication, the increased likelihood of the leukemia. I suggest that you get your affairs in order, Elizabeth, before you begin, she said. So I did. Being a wife and a mother to three young children, I sat down and wrote what I felt I wanted to say to Brad and our kids. I told them I had had a good life. I recommended that Brad remarry. I designated a few sentimental objects to my children, a ring to Gabe, a necklace to Maddie, and a semi-precious stone to Toby that was the exact color of his eyes. But as you can see, I didn't die. I'm still here. This week, as I contemplated the scripture readings, especially the gospel lesson, I wished I could go to the safe deposit box at my bank and pull out that letter I wrote so long ago to see what I considered was the sum of my life up to that point in my life and what was important to me then. But with all the snow, and the close quarters of the vault at my bank, I opted not to. Instead, I began to think about the sum of my life up till now and what I would write now to my children and my husband if I were given the same instructions to put my affairs in order. Because this is what I believe Jesus was saying to his disciples and is saying to us this morning. Pay attention. Get your affairs and your lives in order. And I am going to tell you, I am telling you how to do it, he says. If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who live their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospels will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? These words demand reflection on the meaning of life and death, specifically upon the meaning of our individual lives, our lifetimes, how we want to be remembered after we die and how we live on after death. I put before you, how we define life and death 
has a lot to do with how we understand God and in the Christian context, how we define Jesus. When Jesus asked his disciples on the road to Caesarea Philippi, who do people say that I am? His disciples said, John the Baptist, Elijah, or one of the prophets. But when he asked them, who do you say that I am? Peter said, you are the Messiah. Jesus explained that being the Messiah, he must undergo great suffering, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and only then after three days rise again. Yet Peter was having none of it. That is not how he understood what it meant to be the Messiah, and he rebuked Jesus. In response, Jesus chastised Peter, saying he needed to stop thinking on human things and instead focus on divine things. As humans, it is hard not to think on human things. Our bodies, our chronological age, our house that gives us shelter, the food we put in our bellies, our possessions that we associate with happiness or beauty or accomplishment, our children. And when we are told to get our affairs in order, it is these human things that we often turn to, to arrange and put in place in plans. How we understand who Jesus is tells us a lot about how we understand ourselves. In Peter's case, Jesus being the Messiah meant that Jesus would live long enough to vanquish all of Israel's enemies and bring the people back to the glory and time of King David. Retribution, revenge, political and military might were, were all part of the meaning of Peter's Messiah. Instead, Jesus wanted his followers to understand him as a martyr Messiah, that he was willing to die to teach others that life can be, continue beyond the grave, and that if they too would die in service to something higher, they too might live. What Jesus wanted his followers to know, to understand, is who he was as the Messiah, and who they were, and we are, is all deeply tied together. Only through understanding the connection between how one lives and dies to self during one's lifetime, could they and we understand the meaning of life, who Jesus was and is, and the true understanding of his messiahship. On a small scale, perhaps, maybe you have given something away that you were really looking forward to having. Maybe a just purchased warm pizza to a worn out bedraggled person on an honor. Or maybe a $20 winning scratch ticket to the person behind you in line. Or maybe a scarf you love, but could see it would look so much better on a neighbor. And for the record, I have done none of these things, but I have seen others do these very same things. Maybe you have forgiven someone who took something beloved and priceless beyond measure or done some other act of self-sacrifice. While taking up Jesus's cross, dying to oneself and losing one's life, what it looks like is different for each and every one of us. One person's treasure or eager ego is not the same as another's. What is the same for all of us as followers of Jesus is the realization that we can take none of this with us beyond the grave. Clothes, money, children, education, pets. We are called instead to do something with what we have during our lifetimes for others and the world. On Friday morning, I listened to a story on NPR and it's a radio show called StoryCorps. And here it is. When Tony Hicks was just 14, he was a member of a gang in California. In an attempt to rob a pizza delivery guy driver with his gang, Tony shot the driver. The pizza guy's name was Tariq Kamisa. 
He was 20 years old and a college student. Tony pled guilty and was sentenced to prison until he was 21. Five years later, Tariq's father decided to go to the prison and meet the boy who killed his son. Tony said the prospect of meeting his victim's dad made him very anxious leading up to the visit. Not only was he very ashamed for what he, has, he had done, he wished he had chosen differently on that horrible day. The father upon sitting down with the now 19 year old saw his remorse and forgave him. Tony told him all about his shame and regret. Upon leaving the prison that day, the father said he felt so much lighter, like there was a spring in his step. And to the person that he told the story to, he said, I don't know why I waited so long. I wish I had done it five years ago. Tony said, upon release from prison, I went back to where I murdered Tariq to bring my past and present together. I wanted to affirm, to reaffirm to Tariq, I was a changed person and that I wouldn't squander this opportunity. In forgiving Tony, Tariq let go, Tariq's father let go of and laid down anger, gave up retribution and put to death feelings and impulses that the world tells us we are justified in having and acting upon when a child is brutally killed. Yet in dying to the chance to vindicate his son, the father regained his life and he extended his life far beyond his own mortal life with the change that occurred in young Tony's life. At Tony's sentencing hearing, Tony's grandfather, Place Flalix, pledged to Tariq's family that he would do anything they ever needed. Then together, Felix and the Camisa family became very close and then formed a restorative justice program for young people who commit crimes. Tony too worked on the program in prison and continues to still. When I went to read the story online, I saw it came up with a photo of two men, Tony and Tariq's father, their arms flung over each other's shoulders, smiling, and full of life, life that has the chance to live long after them. In this story, we hear of confession, forgiveness, redemption, of work to change the evils of power that kill and punish, and the power of justice restored. We hear of self-sacrifice. We hear of humanity. Who do I, and we say, Jesus is. All of these things. Living in service for others, denying oneself, caring for the needs and problems of people who are not like us, who are not us, goes against what our culture these days teaches us. It is not easy. In the words of G.K. Chesterton, Christianity has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and left untried. Who do I say that I am? Who do you say that you are? After I am fully vaccinated in April, I am scheduled to begin a new medication for my MS. Though it is much touted, I am under no impression that it is a wonder drug. Blessedly, so far as I understand it, I am not being suggested at this point, get my affairs in order before starting it. And yet I think I will do just that. Retrieve my holographic last will and testament from my safe deposit box and rewrite it. I will leave in the part about the sentimental objects to my children. And I will add what I have learned as a follower of Jesus how I have gained my life many times over when I put my ego aside and took up the cross, the causes of those who are in need. I pray that my children will come to understand this too, that they may get their affairs in order far more quickly than this 55 year old 
me that it took. Who do you say Jesus is? Who do you say you are? What will your answers be? Amen. Before we begin our time of prayer, I would like to ask, as always, if anyone has any joys or concerns to lift up. And you can just uh, raise your hand and unmute your mic or write it in the comments section um, of, of the chat. Any joys or concerns? Yes, Walter. I guess this is really neither a joy or a concern in, the, in that sense, but it is something that the congregation might be able to help uh, with. You had emailed me about finding pictures of a previous uh, minister of our church. Uh, and I called Bobby and I called Joan. And, and we need the help of anybody who has been rummaging around in the church as to where their photo albums might be. Violet, I think, would be the one to contact if, if, uh, but anyway, we need that help. Uh, and you might ex explain why those pictures are needed. Um, sure, it's of Reverend Ganglefinger, but let Shannon speak to this. Um. Megan McGinnis, who grew up about two or three houses after the church. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, she reached out to me because she works at Orono Commons with Pastor Ganglefinger's uh, wife. And she's experiencing dementia. And Megan wanted to share some photos with her uh, to sort of generate conversation and, you know, sort of peace. Um, I didn't attend church when Pastor Ganglefinger was there. It was right before Pastor Morgan. Um, but I understand there might be photo albums. Um, and what I was gonna recommend if it was possible is uh, when the social committee meeting is on Wednesday, and I'm not sure what time that is, if maybe if the photo albums are up on that shelf that we were talking about, um, we could look through them. I know what Megan looked like when she was that age, but I don't know what Pastor Ganglefinger looked like. Um, and uh, I mean, there's always the possibility we could invite Megan as well if she wasn't on a work shift uh, to take a look herself. She can simply take pictures on her phone and, and uh, take them down to Mrs. Ganglefinger. That's, you know, but it's um, just something if, if it's an option, she uh, sought us out for that. Thank you, Shannon, for, for bringing that up. I think that is really beautiful. Um, and first, I will just say that uh, at the beginning of my call, Violet would frequently come in and take down photo albums from that shelf just as you enter the hall. And she would put in photos or obituaries of people, members that had passed. So I know that some exist. Um, so that would be my first place to suggest. Um, if anybody here uh, remembers uh, Reverend Ganglefinger or his wife, or has pictures from that time, um, uh, please perhaps contact Shannon um, and pass them on to her or take a photo and send them to her. Um, I did find out that he served from February uh, 2001 to uh, 2003, right before Darren Morgan. So um, th that's sort of the time period that we're looking for. Um, so thank you, Shannon. And we will keep her in our prayers for sure. Um, and her family. Thank you, Walter, for bringing that up. Are there any other joys or concerns um, this morning? And feel free to speak up if you have them. No? I do just want to say that um, my daughter Madeline got into medical school, into a medical school. So we are very excited. Um, we have been told that sometimes you apply to a bunch of schools and you just get into one, or maybe you get into two. Um, it's very hard 
about 1% or 2% of the applicants get admitted. So we are just really happy. Um, and it sounds like a great school for her and, and who she is. So um, that is a real joy um, for us today. I want to um, mention that uh, I heard through Facebook, through Susan Bushnell, that Don Stickney um, has COVID for a second time. It just sounds awful. Um, I don't know if he's gotten it before his shot or whatever, um, but let's hold him in our prayers. And also Audrey um, could not join us this morning because she has a bad sinus infection. So let's, um, I had that last week, so like completely uh, can empathize um, with her and hold her in our prayers as well. Uh, oh, and the final thing I want to just is a joy. <clears throat> I spent a little bit of this past week watching a PBS documentary on the, the experience of the black church in America. And it was incredible, um, incredible singing. I learned a lot about history of the United States, but also about uh, the black church, uh, African-Americans. And um, you can, it comes on Tuesday nights. I think it might've finished because it's the end of black history month. I'm not sure, but you can watch it on your computers. It's right there under on the PBS website. Um, and so it was a joy for me and I uh, uh, commend it to you. So if there are no other uh, uh, joys or concerns, I, it is a joy to see uh, Ethan there in the picture. Hi, Ethan, good morning. Hi. Uh, yeah, uh, hi. Hi. He would like to tell us all we're awesome. So I was waiting to see if he was gonna do that. Oh, you're awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you are a joy always. And it's just a joy to have you in our lives, Ethan, and to see you growing into such a fine young man. So, so let us be in the spirit of prayer. God of Sarah and Abraham, we come to you in adoration, <clears throat> thanksgiving and supplication. We praise you and thank you for the ancestors of old on whose shoulders we stand. Excuse me. <clears throat> Long ago, Sarah and Abraham entered into a covenant with you to follow you and you promise them your blessing. As their blessed descendants, we now come to you seeking our own blessings. We pray for continuing guidance as we strive to lay down our wants so we can more easily pick up others' needs. Focus our minds, our impulses, our hearts on the divinity in the world of humanity. Remind us of and open us up to your divine spark in those the world has cast aside. Strengthen us so we can put aside our ego and the power structures that prop it up and enable us to take up your cross, both bearing others' pain so they too can know the grace of mercy and justice. This morning, we celebrate the joy of media in the secular world about the church, celebrate Madeline getting into a med school. We celebrate Ethan, who is a joy to us all. And we lift up in prayer this morning, Reverend Gangle Finger's wife, Don Stickney, and Audrey. Grant, O oh God, that these prayers we offer be a channel for new and abundant life, not only hoped for, but worked for through faithful word and deed. We now lay before you the silent desires of our hearts, praying for transformation and fulfillment in our own lives, as well as all those who suffer in mind, body, and spirit. And as your son taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
and our closing hymn is one that I think we all know. It's kind of nice to end with something we know, right? And it is Faith of Our Fathers. <laughs> now may the Lord bless you and keep you. Now may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Here ends our worship. I will end the recording.